And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, tell us about the country before you get into the college. I mean, all we know is the crazy politicians we know yeah, about on yeah. TV, we know about the mm -hmm. dictatorship there, the violence, the brutality of the culture. Why Uganda? Why Brother Francis? Well, the brothers from Canada had set up a very good program in Uganda. They have about 11 or 12 very good high schools. And they have six, five or six good elementary schools. So they have a good high school, good elementary school. And uh, they had tried to f organize a small university about 25, 30 years before that. But at that time, the government did not allow anybody else than the federal government to set up a university. So nobody could set up a university. So they were not given permission. But about 10 years ago, they revoked that decision. And so anybody who's qualified and has the proper personnel was able to set up a university. So the brothers wanted to set up a university. And uh, so they had tried and, and uh, tried two, three times and it hadn't worked. So then the, uh, the superior general who knew me, who had visited Walsh, told him, he said, well, Brother Francis was a former college president. Why don't you just call him and ask him to see, what he, see if he can do some work? And then basically that's what happened. Uh, they, they invited me. I remember the, I asked him, I said, well, what resources have you, what resources have you organized so that to set up this small university? So they said, well, we got this brother, this brother. I only see one person with a PhD and I only see two or three people with master's degree. You can't, I set up, a, you know. so, so then, and then they, I said, and how much money do you, he said, well, we thought of borrowing $20,000. I said, borrowing $20,000 instead of a university? You know, so it just, they didn't have any concept at all. So basically, uh, but once, you know, I, I was there for about eight years, and uh, the, the school actually started very small, 60, 60 students, almost the way Walsh did, started with 60 students, and then when I left, we were about 750. Now they're about 850. So we, they were increasing by about, we were increasing by about 60 a year. You know, 60, 65, depending on the years. Not, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't want to increase too fast because, first of all, a lot of that you have to provide scholarships. So the more students are there, obviously, the more money you have to try to raise. And then uh, at the same time, we were setting up small dorms, dorms of about 30 students, so that they would, you would have almost like a little, uh, you would have a kind of a small group that, of people that would, of uh, friends, who would become a small community. So then they would be, let's say, freshmen living in that dorm, coming in, there's your dorm. And so there the third of you live, live together and work together and enjoy each other's company. I hesitated for a long time though because I was 74 years old and I already was doing quite, I was working for the homeless over here. I was working for the main council of churches. I was writing a weekly column in, in the church world. And so I said, am I, am I stupid? I'm going to Uganda. I'm doing, I'm, so I'm doing some, I'd say, good work over here. I'm going over there. I don't know the situation. I don't know the environment. I don't even know whether or not it's the right thing to do. So I hesitated. And in fact, I hesitated so much, I had already committed myself. But then, about 24 hours later, I wake up in the middle of the night. I said, this is crazy. What the hell am I doing going to Uganda at my age when I'm already doing some good work over here? I really don't know what the right thing is, the right decision is. 
I know I could probably help them. Probably, but I'm not sure. And then uh, I, I know that I'm doing some work here, so what's the right decision? So I basically did not know. And so I was kind of emotional. It was, it was about maybe two or three o'clock in the morning. And uh, I just couldn't go back to sleep. So I said, I'm going to go to the chapel and I'm going to pray. So I said, okay, I'll make a deal with you, Lord. You're, whatever the first reading is, whatever the first reading is this morning in the, in the liturgy, you're going to give me an answer. So and that was the deal. So I, if you want me to take the, the, give me an answer. So I had a, a reading from Jeremiah. Now, I'm not sure if I know it all, but I, I know the gist of it. It says, the gist was this, Jeremiah, I know well the plans I have in mind for you. Plans for your welfare, not for war. Plans to give you a future full of hope. When you call on me, I will listen. When you seek me, you will find me. And I will change your lot. I will bring you back from the land to which I am exiling you. So, pretty strong message. I mean, right on point. You know, and then I knew that I would do well because I will give you a future full of hope. When you call on me, I will listen. When you, when you seek me, you will find me. So it was such a striking message that I felt that I couldn't go wrong. That, and then I also knew that I would be coming back because, and I will bring you back Excellent. from the land to which I am exiling you. Now that's, so I, for seven or eight years I was in exile. But actually it was not a bad, it was not a bad situation. Brother, your whole life though prepared you for that. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like there was some divine intervention? Obviously there was with yeah. uh, the reading from Jeremiah, yeah. but your whole life prepared you for uh, that experience. Yeah, actually, the, a commitment to you know that in, in a religious in a religious community, you don't really have an option. You you're supposed to be committed if you're taking it seriously. 